Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shining Podcast. This is your host, Steve Inspector. And with me, as usual, is Rob Hirschfeld. Uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, whatever time it is today, Rob. Good it's to the dog days of summer. It's dog days. Texas, Austin, Texas is supposed to be 108 degrees. See, this is, I like this report. It reminds me why I moved away. And uh, right now, we're, <laughs> in, we're about 78 here in Boise, but it will be 98 by like seven at night. It takes us an entire day to warm up, but you guys warm up for an hour. And uh, we have a Texas guest. Texas better. Yeah, oh. and I'm, I'm excited about our guest today. You know me, I always like to meet new people. And so uh, today we have Ash Young, who is the chief evangelist for a company called, hopefully I say it right, Ash, Kashingo? Yep, Kashingo. Kashingo, and is also the ambassador for Open NFE for almost two years. With open source, I love it. So, Ash, why don't you give us kind of a brief rundown about yourself for our listeners who aren't familiar, and then uh, we'll jump into a variety of topics. I've been around open source since uh, the early 90s when uh, I uh, contributed some uh, source code that kind of kicked off the whole RAID controller support within the uh, the early kernels. And then um, I think most notably um, did the first open source kind of fast storage stuff back in the uh, around 2000. But I've uh, been doing it, been doing it for a little while. Love open source. I, honestly, I never want to be proprietary ever again. So, Ash, you, you and I met, I want to talk about what your, what Cash and Go is doing, which Cash is like this cash for people who are, who are listening, not, not, uh, payday loan. And then we'll, we'll, we'll get into your open source background because you and I met, uh, I think for the first time in Tokyo at the OpenStack Summit. We've, we've had some real fun interactions since then with some of the net, open networking pieces. But for people listening, we'll get to that. That's going to be fun. I think we're probably going to switch into Redcast format um, and talk about open source and open networking and, and some of the challenges in the industry where Ash has super deep experience. I, I think it's really helpful to give people a background on what you're trying to solve right now. And, and I know there's open source you know, aspects of what you're building also. Sure. Give us some background. Back in the uh, back in the mid nineties, you know, you had two you well, you had one big jugger company called Ostec, and you had this kind of fledgling startup called NetApp. Very few folks probably remember them back in those days or even remember who Ostec even was. But, uh, it was the early days of trying to do converged protocol appliances. The thought back then was, okay, let's go ahead and pay thirty thousand dollars or whatever it was, some outrageous price for a for a developer suit of Wind River and let's go develop a, a proprietary operating system to do this network pet storage appliance and I said, hmm, there's this Linux thing that I'm kind of dabbling with. Let's go ahead and play with that instead. And back then BS uh free BSD was pretty popular and there's all these reasons to go with that, but for some reason I thought this uh I thought Linux was a better way to go. Anyway, so that was back in the uh, kind of the late 90s that I went down that route and created the first all-in-one network pet storage client based on Linux. And if you fast forward now, it's 2018. Nothing's really changed with that whole approach. It's still, here's a, here's a motherboard. There's a whole bunch of disks behind it. You've got your Linux operating system, Samba, and a few other little pieces in there. I mean, it could be it could be SAP, it could be NFS, it could be, you know, whatever protocol stack running behind that. Not much has changed. All we've done is we just kept increasing the uh, the density of the whole thing and then wonder why the the processor continues to be the bottleneck. So I said, let's change this up a little bit. I was I've been trying to get certain hardware vendors, including my last uh employer Huawei to change things up and change the architecture, but no one really wanted to touch this almost 20-year-old architecture. So I decided, let's let's try this. Let's, you know, and all my assumptions behind it were wrong. I thought adding a processor, adding mix, adding memory to, to every single drive would just drive the cost up, drive the complexity up. Certainly power consumption would go through the roof. And I was pleasantly surprised to see that Gee, the total cost went down, the throughput went up, the uh, and the power consumption dropped significantly. And when I'm talking about cost and power consumption, I'm talking like greater than 10x kind of reductions in both areas. 
then I started dabbling into, and, and I really got to credit someone from, uh, from AT&T who kind of pushed the envelope on this. I was telling her about this little appliance that I prototyped that I created. That sounds really great. Is there any way that you can kind of incorporate some kind of a demo of that at Mobile World Congress? Yeah, I think so. Why not? We started talking a little bit further. It turned into, hey, let's try to do an embedded face recognition app on top of this, uh, on top of this new storage architecture. I thought, okay, that's, that's pretty novel. Let's go for that. So why not, right? I mean, store the pictures right there on the drives, right there where we were thinking would be a great place for, you know, a great new design for cold storage. Put the app right there. Then it turned into, Hey, do you think you can do anything with the GPU there? Do you think you can offload any of this? I got to think, yeah, I mean, yeah, sure, why not? I suppose we could probably run a neural network or a couple off the, uh, off the GPU. Now, bear in mind, we've been talking about this kind of stuff for years. In fact, I co-authored with some of the ARM guys and, and one of the Intel guys, function offload, uh, parts of the specification. This was back in 2013. So we've been talking about this for a while, but, Talking about it and doing it were completely different things. I've never done any of this before. So I had like two months to, to come up with everything to show up at Barcelona. And everyone's asking me, you know, what is this thing? And I had to preface all the discussions with, now, let me explain to you, I am not a facial recognition person. My life as I knew it kind of changed for me. Um, you know, again, the whole, my whole, point of going down that path was I, I really wanted to evolve the way that we're doing persistent storage, cold storage. I think the way people are doing has been wrong. It's been a sore spot for me, a frustration for me, for over a decade now, and I finally just decided to do something about it, and that's kind of what led to the thing to There's two things that come to mind for me about what you're saying, because one of them, you know, differentiating what you're doing from current storage. But some of what you're describing to me is, is Hadoop, right? Where the whole idea with HDFS was to store image, store data locally, process data locally. How is what you're doing in this model different than an HDFS cluster from a, a local analytical storage? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And honestly, I think the only difference is I went a little bit further. I Hey, Deep introduced a whole new approach for analytics to the open source community. But my problem was the hardware, right? I mean, you had, you had things like Seagate's Kinetics and some of, uh, some of your listeners might, uh, might uh, be familiar with Kinetics. Well, you had basically a proprietary hard drive with a proprietary stack. It's going to do object-based storage at a disk drive level as opposed to at a motherboard and server level. It was a great idea. You and I, I think, probably have some similar feelings about proprietary protocols versus open source protocols. You had WD Labs follow right on their heels with, here's our proprietary drive with a fairly open stack that you could actually, you could actually go and modify and run whatever protocols you want on it, so it's extensible. And that was a huge improvement, I thought. It didn't really go very far, and I was kind of sad to see that. But at the end of the day, it came down to you really kind of have to have uh, extensibility or, or customizations at both ends. You need both uh, the ability to do open hardware and open software, which I decided to come up with a reference design that would do that, that would allow for that, really make all of the drives whether they're flash based or any form factor of disk drive extensible with new with new features. Boy, so Ash, I mean the thing that, that struck me when we were discussing this uh, before is that you the whole design is moving intelligence onto the drives, right? And and I've seen a whole bunch of designs you were talking about, some of them, of single single drive computers, right? Where basically it was a network attached storage of a single drive, and then you could aggregate all those things together to create a cluster. This sounds like you built it. It's just a super hard thing to build. It, it was, and and I've got friends who, um, I mean, their companies just do this for a living, and they do just an exceptional job. And you know, I can remember telling them how many servers I 
wanted to pack into a one U. I thought I really like a one U form factor because I hate sacrificing real estate. And they said, well, the most you're probably going to fit into a one U doing what you want and having GPU capabilities at, at a drive level is, um, is eight. And I thought switching back into combination of mathematics and uh, marketing mode, I was like, the amortization on eight sucks. <laughs> so I yeah. thought, <laughs> I really want to get 24. And I was just, I, everyone told me couldn't do it. I went out to some professional companies to help do the design for me, and they said, can't do it. The end result is I was so excited when it worked in a diagram. <laughs> so I started doing all the mechanical design myself, and gee, voila, it, it, it worked on paper. And then, uh, then I got all the uh, prototype components in, and it worked physically right, right before my eyes. And then, long story short, you know, so 24 in a 1U was 24 servers and 24 drives in a 1U, so 48 devices and a switch. All that stuff in a 1U was accomplished. And then I was talking to a, in an open source meeting, and a vendor ticked me off because they were conflating things and confusing the issue and equating more drives in a, in a 1U to more, having more servers. So I decided to one-up them, and I managed to fit 48 drives, GPUs, mix, a switch, and flash drives into a 1U. And then, you know, I mean, you know me well enough to know that I, I can't rest at that. Now I've come up with a design to fit 96 of them into a 1U. I mean, these are, and it, it's weird because they are servers and they're not servers, right? Each right. drive is an IP address, it's its own network attached storage, has right. its own protocol. That's why you need the switch. So, you know, in a way, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll say back, you know, this is not Hadoop. This is truly a distributed storage array. And so while you're putting them in a one new chassis, you could start taking this and distributing storage at, so it's so small. And if it has onboard analytics capability, you could actually distribute, you know, graphics, gra graphics or uh, AIs or machine learning into the machines itself. These are these are storage focused microservices, microservers. Is that a well, yeah, exactly. And if you think about, you know, where so much of your work has been lately, I mean, making the hardware keep up with this whole notion of microservices and everything else that we've been kind of trending towards for the last several years. It just took a while for the hardware to keep to to I think catch up, and which is weird because the processors have gotten better, networking's gotten better, all the building blocks have gotten better, but at a system level, we just haven't taken advantage of it with as much emphasis in the billions yeah. of dollars we've been spending on IoT. Everyone forgets at the end of the day, every you, you open up your computer, it's a great example of everything in there is IoT if you really uh, you compose it all. So that's all I did. Interesting approach to thinking about it. Yeah, so you're, you're decomposing. But to me, when I look at industry trends, operations, people always underestimate operational complexity. So one of the reasons we're very slow to innovate on hardware is because changing out anything in the hardware stack disrupts everybody's operational models. You come in with a new server type ARM. This is a classic ARM problem. It's a switch management problem, too. If they're not using Pixie, or even iPixie, then managing them becomes, you know, it doesn't fit, and now you've got two models. You know, we end up, not not that we don't want these innovative hardware styles, but we, but managing new things in with a 90s pattern is painful, but managing it without the 90s pattern is painful. Right. The answer is no innovation. Or you, you, no you're adoption. Very, yeah, you're, you're, you're very correct, right? I mean, you know, and, and we're at that point where we're forced to have to deal with this, whether it's, you know, managing millions of handsets to billions of handsets, right? Or, you know, managing, you know, millions to billions of smart devices that want to connect onto our network. We have to find a way to deal with it. Now, I, in some ways, kind of exacerbated the problem by let's take a whole bunch of these things and throw them into a chassis. So I simplified some things and I complicated some others. But, um, you know, rest assured, 
uh, the operations folks, there's no pixie involved with trying to provision anything. They got right. full flexibility. I mean, there's a lot that you had to, re- that I had to work out, you know, right down to how do you talk to these things? These are going to, they're going to sit behind a multitude of firewalls, these appliances. And how do you go ahead and talk to these things without opening up holes all over the place? And mm-hmm. that was the, that was really, I actually tackled that problem before I ever even tackled the, uh, the issue of packaging. Because I, I kind of just knew that you had to be able to talk to these things securely and do the provisioning. And I learned all kinds of neat tricks about provisioning from you and your, your folks. You guys, if anyone's mastered that art, it's, it's, uh, it's your team. We work hard on it. So do you, is there some lesson learned? Is there some component that, is, that you can share on, on what, you know, what's your approach to managing, you know, you find about hundreds and hundreds of devices, a hundred devices in a year, effectively. Yeah, I, I basically call it, you know, the, the industry is becoming familiar with, more familiar with network slicing and tunneling. I, I think that there's a fundamental flaw in the way that people are, are communicating with, uh, with devices these days. There's an over-dependence tunneling, tunneling protocols that really build up and require large core networking. Um, okay. Like a VPN? In that perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Like a VPN. This thing connects into it and this other thing connects into it. So then you got this big proxy in the middle that is, can both congest or be, um, be attacked. And I thought, well, you know, it'd be really great if we learned a thing or two from the piraters and, <laughs> and, and started leveraging, you know, if we're going to go down this IoT front, let's go ahead and start doing more peer to peer stuff. So, so I call it peer to peer network slicing. The, uh, the large equipment guys really hate me. Some of them get a kick out of it, like in FIDO, we had VPP, and I did some hacks to basically come up with what I called VPP to P, which is a mouthful to try to say, but it's, uh, you know, I was trying to be a little bit funny there, and some people liked it, some people thought I was a little bit too much. But I think leveraging a lot of the peer-to-peer stuff uh, comes in handy, so things like tunneling TCP packets through through uh, UDP and little tricks like that and and uh, starts coming in handy and you know there's just a lot out there that has been done but just hasn't been done in this context before what do you mean so so like a software defined networking topology on top of this i mean i yeah yeah software so i'm very big in software defined networking um i have to keep reminding folks there that i really am a storage person i'm really not a networking person but even working with um onos and cord and 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 open daylight, there's just this propensity towards we can do we can do VPNs and we can do VPNs and if you want some other type of tunneling, no problem. You can have whatever you want. Just can we make it a variation of a VPN? And um, the idea of let's remove the um, let's move away from any kind of proxying whatsoever and move entirely to I really just want to make an introduction this device to this other device and then let them talk directly and I get out of the way. That whole notion is, is pretty foreign, but it's all, um, it's all software defined. In fact, that's, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been working to, uh, to integrate our peer to peer network slicing into the heart of, uh, Onos and Cord. I'm interested in this. So, so there's an interesting place and, and I want to follow through on my promise to, to nudge us back towards these, these broader open source topics. Mm-hmm. Um, although I feel like I'm only at the tip of that iceberg on, on what you, what you're building and how. So there's, there's a storage piece that you're, you're immediately pulled back because, because you're building storage, but it's networked storage in a, in that's a way that, that's totally different than usually when we build network storage, we take a, a relatively small number of systems, put a lot of drive behind them, and then right. we have storage, storage aggregation point storage gateway. You're disaggregating. So every storage node has to be part of the network. Every every drive. Has to be. That's correct. Which then moves you into a, a world of network challenge. It means that you have to become better at networking. Absolutely. Instead of having to provision a NIC, you've got uh, 24, 48, or 96 NICs in this case, um, just for one box. The benefit that you have is. You know, if you're cr- trying to create a Ceph cluster, for example, and you need three object storage devices, that's no longer three sh- three um, three separate boxes, right, of a whole bunch of drives. That's now three devices inside of one box if you wanted it to be. 
So some right. things get more complicated. The only thing that gets really more complicated is that I have more IP addresses that I have to then therefore manage. So I have to get more clever about how I how I manage those, how I slice those, how I how I set up my security and things like that. And that's really where the complexity is. How do I manage my IP addresses? How do I reconcile that these IP addresses belong to these members inside of this physical box, inside of this rack, inside of this data center? So right. that that kind of that becomes well, more right. complicated, not because of the way we implemented it. That becomes more complicated just by the sheer fact that you can fit now many more cert microservers into a typical into a typical data center. Well, and if you're doing class, uh, you're, if you're doing IPv4, you're going to be exhausting you know class a uh, class C on almost in almost in two years. This isn't a you know you're you're not you're, you're talking about massive internal private networks and then needing a way to connect all those systems together because wow I mean, that, that's where the magic is and what is so what does magic mean you say, you say magic what is magic what, what, what problems are we solving with magic let me put it to you this way so first of all this can hang off your network if you're sitting there on your network and you're concerned about security you can talk to this you can talk to our devices from anywhere in the world without ever opening up a single port on your firewall without the use of any kind of VPNs. If you think about it, if you've ever used TeamViewer or anything like that, then you know that, okay, this type of technology really simple, this peer-to-peer -peer technology really simplifies things from a security standpoint. The days of having your administrator set up port forwarding on a router, that's over. There's no need to go buy some kind of a Pixie firewall server for you to connect into and for then other offices to connect into. We don't need any of that stuff anymore. That's 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 dated. It's, so once but, you get once you get past that, it starts right. getting it starts getting easier. Then you just really need a tool that makes it really easy to, hey, these devices need to be on a net you know, need to be on a network either all together, you know, or maybe I just want to create a little virtual network that's ten of these devices or five of these devices or just two of them sit on and I want to carve it up in different ways. So you just have to have an idea of how you really want to carve it up. And like I said, we really try to go out of our way to make that easy for someone. I've, I've got our stuff, I feel like I've got our stuff scattered all around the globe. It's not that over, it's not really not overwhelming at all. It's, it's just hard sometimes, I think, for the brain there to wrap around just simply because we're so used to doing things where there's something in the middle. We have to have something in the middle. Right. We have to have a proxy of some type. I mean, even there's so many... So you're, you're, you, have to, you have to have a trusted source. I mean, what you're describing allowing two systems behind two different firewalls to communicate, I mean, without, you have to have some trust, you know, some trust broker in the middle. I, I have, you know... Of some type, yes. That's, that, that's correct, right? I mean, to some degree... That is true. You have to have somebody, you have to have a broker that can say, hey, person A meet person B. Right. Now, now there you go and you step out of the way. The way we've been doing things is that broker always stays in the middle and he's there to listen to every, every all traffic flows through him. In this particular case, he's just saying, you know, hey, A meet B, go have at it. I'm out of here. I'm working on something else. I, uh, yeah, I guess this is maybe where my lack of knowledge of software defined networking is too limited. Because typically the reason the broker stays in the middle is because the clients, the two endpoints, they initiate the connection, it terminates at the broker, the broker's public, and then the, you know, to get that out of the way, you would have to be able to take that TCP connection and connect the two endpoints without open ports, right? So that they can route traffic to each other as if neither had terminated the traffic. And that, that would be better. Yeah. Right. And that and that brings up the challenges with trying to scale as we're moving aggressively towards edge computing. You think about all the traffic that then has to move through those proxies and they're not you know, and, and we're trying to scale, you know, I mean the fan out's pretty Pretty big. If you're if you're dealing with uh, with telecom, the idea of how their central offices will break out into form their edge cloud, you know, just put a multiplier on on how many more edge 
endpoints that's going to be off of each central office. And that is a lot of proxying of traffic going through that network when, when it's not always necessary. Like you and me communicating. I mean, you know, I would like to be able to, I'm not sure who your, you know, who your service provider is. And it doesn't really even matter who your service provider is, if it's a cable provider or a telecom provider. If I want to send stuff to you, I want to use the pipes. I don't necessarily want to go to a third party you know, yet another third party to go ahead and route everything to you. And, and, and that's, and that's kind of essentially the, the path that we've been going down. What I was trying to solve with this whole thing wasn't even any of that. It was just simply, it, it was just a physics issue. And that was, Hey, you know, if you're going to say increase and fan out tenfold off of each central office and create this wall of edge servers, there, each one of those is 3,000 watts a piece or 2,000 watts a piece. That's going to get expensive real fast. And I remember, I remember I was at a, I, I, I listened to, um, someone from China Mobile talk about the 5G problem and the, the, the density we had to drive towards to meet the 5G expectations, but that we had an obligation to cut the carbon footprint. And you know me well enough to know that I'm not, Mr. Politically Correct. I'm not, certainly not. I would, you know, I'd never be accused of being a member of Greenpeace or any other conservation organization. But I really believe that, you know, we have some obligations to be smarter about how we did things. So, you know, well, the, I, I, I don't think it's a matter of politics to think about reducing the energy footprint of the data yeah, center. It's, 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 it's responsibility. Yeah, right. it's responsibility um, to some degree, but. You know, I did a, uh, what I call the TCO calculator for, uh, for, for one operator. And I calculated that what they were looking at doing or had to do versus using is this 24 node box is only a hundred watts, <laughs> hundred terabytes of storage and, and, uh, 24 servers in it. And it's about a hundred watts. It worked out to about uh, a quarter billion dollars a year in just power consumption savings versus the alternative. And I thought, yeah. that's kind of a big deal. It, it, you know, it's funny because I've been you know, in data centers a long time, and power is a concern. It certainly, it's a concern when it comes to uh, a data center's capacity to power a rack, which is where we usually bump into it. And I've talked to people for a long time about shutting servers off when they're not used or the real you know, power utilization. But at the end of the day, that hasn't been the motivating factor for, for machines, right? We're still... Building, you know, machines that consume a lot of power, putting a lot of drives in them, using them 24-7, even if the utilization is sub-10%. Because what I found is problems are much harder to solve than turning the machines on and off, right? The impact of turning the machine off that you didn't want to is typically severe enough that people leave them on, which makes my conservation side sort of sad that I, you know, I've been in the industry 20 years trying to help with this problem. So I agree. I, I I I agree with you. In my mind, that it, it was a pretty big deal. Quarter billion dollars a year. That that mean, it means something to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. And and if you've got enough of, and, and that was just looking at one use case. We live in a world right now where we're talking so much on the orchestration side of things of, of infrastructure and utilizing machine learning and. Um, and other types of dynamic analytics to dynamically change the policies as opposed to relying on static configuration, uh, static, uh, uh, static right. policies. I'm like, well, you're going to have to stick something somewhere on your network that's going to do that if you really want to truly leverage machine learning. And that was another thing that I thought, okay, and, and, and this is an evolution of thoughts here. It's not like I woke up one day and I just, I'm so, you know, the smartest guy on the planet. I had all these thoughts. Uh uh. I mean, I, 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 do it. Yeah. It, it was just, it was just one thing after another over the course of a couple of, you know, over a course of a couple of years now. Um, where it's like, well, let me see. Okay. NVIDIA cards in a large workstation. That's really great if I'm genome sequencing. You know, I can recognize the parallel capabilities right away. But in this particular case on the network, uh, with respect to the infrastructure, I could have thousands of data sources 
in that data center or across the data center, right? That infrastructure that's generating input that I want to go ahead and use as input into my machine learning. And, okay. I don't know that I want to, I, I equated it to a funnel. It's like, gee, I've got to get it into a NIC in the operating system before it can ever be dispatched out to this really massively parallel uh, GPU. But, well, what if we could go ahead and just stick, you know, by virtue of these really smart drives, each one networked on the thing, we're basically creating an, a, a massive array of smaller GPUs, which I thought was probably a little bit more in tune with the kind of data sets or functions that we're looking to possibly offload and act upon. And so I thought, okay, I accidentally, I think, happened upon an architecture to solve the machine learning problem in those kind of environments and possibly also out at the edge. I don't think that we have to solve those problems with massive, with really large GPU servers. And it kind of reminded me like of the evolution the disk drive industry or the storage industry went through back in the uh, back in the mid to late 80s with RAID, right? We went from single large expensive drives to to redundant array of inexpensive yeah. drives. That's what the I used to be, right? Until everything became cheap. Well, I think in the case of GPUs, it's the same kind of thing. We could have single large GPUs, but the acronym doesn't work very well. <laughs> it was sleds versus RAIDs, but let's morph that into many, many uh, smaller GPUs. And that's, but yeah. the problem with that is, it's unproven, right? And so that's very new to these organizations. So I thought, well, the one thing everybody needs always is storage. So, you know, just build the, the build a fast, cheap, low power storage thing. Just really change the paradigm there. Make it so, hey, it could be a bad experiment, but you know what? It's so doggone cheap and the, and the reference design is all open. So anyone can take it and do it prove it out themselves. I thought, let's just try it that way. And what have you got to lose? Right? I mean, just go build the thing yourself if you really have to and and see if it and see if it works for you. And if it does, then you have all these you've now created this array of these really low cost GPUs and that you can go ahead and build upon. And so that's really kind of the genesis for what we've been doing. And one last thing Rob related yeah. to that was and again, I, I tie this back to so much of this came back to Mobile World Congress in this almost like this dare that became a double dog dare, triple dog dare with the face recognition, the GPUs and all that stuff. And, all, and at the end of the day, we're snapping, you know, four megabyte, 20 megabyte pictures in some cases. And we ran that through these neural networks that were running just off the GPU on these little drives. And that, and we turned that into a two, little 200 byte vector. That vector represented in this case about 256 key facial features and then a pointer back to the original file, the original picture. So we can do whatever we wanted to within the back of that. Now imagine going across the network wasn't all, you know, hundreds or thousands of four megabyte, 20 megabyte pictures, hundreds to thousands of 200 byte vectors going back to an indexing server to be matched up. Now you think about the network backhaul problem. In one situation, right, you're talking about, you know, reduction of quarter billion dollars in power consumption at the edge to what does that do for the backhaul savings if you can treat everything like that by really doing the analytics, right? You know, capturing the data at the cheapest point as opposed to moving it everywhere, putting it, capturing the data on your fastest stuff, put it on your cheapest stuff drive the first wave of analytics to the cheapest to where the data sits and then just take the uh, take the output take the output of that query or whatever the, it is that you've processed and send that back to um, the so, corporate data. I like this model. This model to me intuitively makes sense. There's a but though. Yep. Um, <laughs> and, and because and, and it's, it's worth pointing out, right, because Peter and I have the benefit of Cross section of, of people thinking through edge technologies, and, and what you built is edge focused technologies. I think it's generally applicable that so we've been talking in the edge context. In that, most people believe that edge infrastructure will be cloud patterned infrastructure, and what you're describing is is not that pattern. You're saying, look, this is this works in an edge model. You build it for an edge model. You deploy it in an edge model. You program it in an edge model. 
not, oh, here is TensorFlow that works in Google Cloud. And by the way, we're going to create a TensorFlow infrastructure on top of an edge infrastructure and make it work. You're actually taking a different, a different strategy here. And, and I guess my, I'm, I'm saying this not to have the debate with you. Um, I'm, I'm saying it for listeners to think this through internally, right? Because it's, it's great to have people come on the show who say, you know what? I, I have a way that challenges the, the entire cost stack minimal data center, you know, high utilization, high cost server model, and I can do the same work in a, in a very interesting way. And I, I have a ton of what-ifs and, and how-dos. You know, we're, we're not going to have time for it, especially if we want to talk open source. I want to lay out that for listeners to, to sort of step back and think through just how many models we're going to see and how we're going to make these decisions and what to yeah, you, 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 you touch on an excellent point there. And the goal wasn't to, the first implementation did use TensorFlow. The second implementation incorporated CAFE. The current implementation path that I'm going down is actually, um, going lower than all of that and, uh, really implementing a lot more of the machine learning, a little bit more native ways down at the, uh, using, uh, tying in with ARM compute library and tying in, uh, more directly even with OpenCL. So just, it's, I think TensorFlow Cafe really set, solve a, um, a larger, more aggregate problem than what we're really trying to do. I'm just trying to make this, make, um, adapt what we've learned to make smarter storage, right. smarter, cheaper, lower power storage. And that's kind of where, that was again, kind of the motivation for and, and the, the pathway of how we got here. I want to pull, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and stop us <laughs> on this track okay. and pull us to a different track, which is open source. Because right, you made a decision to open source your hardware design. You've been involved intimately in a lot of the open networking space around OpenStack and OPNFD. And, and yet, you, you and I talk about open source. There's, there's a concern that we both share about sustaining it, right? What, what does it what what actually pays the bill from an open source perspective? And and that's a question we like to explore. I'm interested in your take. I'm an old school open source person. Um, back before we ever had any of these large collaborative uh, consortiums, um, funded consortiums, there are times when I really miss those days, and it, and it has occurred to me that those days haven't changed. There's if you get if you or I go on GitHub. I don't know if it's too much of a stretch to say that there's millions of projects on there that uh, that are representative of the open source we grew up with. I do recognize, though, the need for the consortiums, especially as it relates to can we agree on some sets of standards? And I'm using the term standards very loosely. Having worked in the standards industry, I know they get really uptight about the distinction between working on a specification to get yeah, working on, 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 on de facto open, standards. Open source projects become reference implementations, not standards. Well, exactly. And and I think of like the early days of iSCSI as they kept rolling from draft to draft in the specification, you had folks that were quickly modifying and, and rapidly releasing open source stack implementations of those of those spec changes and and to me that process was beautiful and i've seen so many examples where the examples are horrible horrible implementations my concern over the state of open source collaborative projects right now is that when you have the funding determined by competing vendors i think the the tendency is to produce the lowest common denominator free thing and and to control that because they all have to desperately try to differentiate from their competitors. I think that denying that is dangerous. And I think that thinking that one collaborative project is going to solve all the problems is a bad place to, <laughs> to sit yep. also because that's not what they were funded for. So they have to maintain and achieve their relevancy in whatever it is that they were founded for. 
and this other guy, this other collaborative project kind of has to do the same thing. But right. at the end of the day, the customer wants an end to end solution that incorporates all this stuff. Someone has to do it. And that's usually going to be a vendor. Ooh. And if it's a vendor, it's going to be a proprietary implementation, probably. Um, or it could be. And we just decided we took a stance that we're not doing open core. We're not going to. Here's a, here's a taste of something that tastes good. And. But if you really want the, the really salient features, the stuff that, you know, does something notable, then you got to pay an arm and a leg for it. I hate open core models. I, I took a stance that everything we do is going to be open source. And it's a hard stance to, to live by, especially, you know, especially try dealing with an investor, you know, and tell them, nope, we're going to give all the source code away. Oh, the hardware designs? Yep, we're giving out all the hardware designs too. Well, how are you going to make money? <laughs> So, so the, here's, here's my dilemma with some of what you just said, is that when you put it all out there, somebody shows up and says, I want to use this incredibly complex configuration. I need to prove that it works. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then they're, they're looking at you like a bum if it doesn't. And if you don't help them saying, well, I want everything to be working perfectly and I need you to show me because it's open source and your name's on it. And I'm going to run around saying your project sucks. You don't help me get this incredibly complex, special snowflake to work. To me, what you're describing is, is, a, is different. Because I see this behavior all the time in all these projects. And vendors need a way to say, wait a second, that is actually support. That is actually your implementation. And I, that's not that's not open source does not include supporting your implementation, right? Or does it? Well, it, it does. But remember the remember the good old days. In fact, if you go to some some projects, you'll still see the uh, the little PayPal logo and and make a donation. You yeah. Know? If you think about like the open source project Wine, right, which really a, a, a lot, it was a Windows emulator on Linux, right, it allowed you to run full fledged uh, Microsoft Office on your on your Linux laptop. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you wanted the new feature and stuff, that's no problem. You can ask for it. But if you wanted to prioritize the feature, what determined their prioritization was how much donation came in. We could become the world's largest organization and employer of developers, right? And we still, it, you, you know this as well as I do, the demand right now outweighs the, the, uh, the, the supply of all the, all the developers mm -hmm. out there. There's got to be a way to set prioritization for adding new features. I mean, I've got um, I've got one company I'm working with right now that wants. To open wait, 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 hold, hold on, I'm going to stop you for a second because I don't think this is about features. I think this you're just is talking. About you're just talking raw support. Just right because because yeah, there's, there's times when somebody says I need something, and usually you know what I I don't mind adding features based on uh, as long as it's not a snowflake. But you know, a lot of times open source interaction drives great user features. And open source requests are a really good way to understand where your product should go. My problem becomes you've deployed it. It's in production. Nobody's paid you for it because it's open source. And yet they have a problem. They have a need. There's some change they want to make. And they're like, well, I, there's no, there's no reason for them to pay you, right? That's, and they're, you know, well, it's open. You, you aren't you standing by the product you wrote? Yeah, I, I, um, I, I've got, um, an anecdote for that. When we did the face recognition stuff and I released that before heading to Barcelona, I thought it was kind of laughable, the implementation that we did in such short notice. It was just me and, and uh, uh, Jimmy LaFontaine, who, uh, works alongside me and, and, um, we both were laughing at it. Here's all the source code. Go have have at it. And folks were offering to license it from us right then. I mean, version 1.0 of of this thing that we'd never done before. And I said, but why do that? That's already there for free. And I really took some time. I think the the directions up up there on GitHub are really good. I wrote them myself. I tested them. They worked very well. I was very proud of those. And it's just go ahead and take it. And it's like, yeah, but we want support. So right. they're willing to pay for support. You do bring up a great point, but there's going to be those folks that are going to take it. And you know what? And, and I wrote it in such a way 
And Jimmy has the same philosophy. We all do, actually. We're almost 20 people now. Everyone's got the same philosophy. We're going to do our best to put out what we think is quality code, commented code, quality code. Um, mm -hmm. But it's there for, you know, there are so many moving parts. If you want to sift through it all and make sense of it and put it up yourself, why not? I mean, you and I have done that for years, figured out how to do that. Our guys have as well. I don't think that there's an implication in, in a, in, a moral obligation or any other obligation to have to stop what we're doing to go support them outside of, you know, the support we provide on our forum. So if someone has questions and stuff, um, come to the forum. We'll do our best to answer those questions. You know, I'll even walk down, you know, if you're having issues trying to compile something, here you go. This is try this instead. We'll do that. If it's, if it's deployed mission critical and we had nothing to do with it, I don't know what we're intercepting on. There's not without getting involved and, you know, taking a look at it. And we'll be happy to do that, but, you know, I mean, we can't just deploy people on site for free. Most companies, at least the ones that I've come across, are fairly understanding in that respect. Uh, I, wish I, they could, they, I wish I shared your, I wish I shared your experience. Our, they, our, could come back, they could come back and tell me that I suck. I probably would not disagree with them a whole lot. And we, you know, we enable this process because we want people to use our software. It's pretty common for people to get to a certain point and then be mad because some, some piece or part that for us requires a lot of support or conversations wasn't just openly available. And when we make things openly available, uh, people expect us to support it for free. I think with your model, yeah, there's, there's always the opportunity to be criticized as is anything in open source right down to writing a driver, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I get a lot of credit. People think that I'm very extroverted and stuff when I'm very introverted. I have a lot of phobias. You name the phobia, I probably have it. And you see me at these uh, conferences and, and I'm sitting there like, I really just don't, all the time, I, I don't want to be there. And it's not because I don't think people are cool or meeting, you know, that's how I met you and, and mm -hmm. we, we forged a friendship and, and I'm thankful for that. But I was in Tokyo for the very first time in my life scared to death, riding a train for the first time in my life, scared to death, <laughs> <You know? laughs> meeting all these new faces. That, again, just so many things that are petrifying and stuff. And then I'm opening myself up to scrutiny on top of that. So so thousands of people worldwide can tell me my code sucks. Yeah. Yep. I, yep. But you know what? But I wouldn't change it. I love open source. And, you know, I, I don't want to be rejected or told that anything that I'm doing is awful. But it's... um. It's the nature of the beast, I suppose, and we're going to do our best to support people. Um, but at the end of the day, I've got an obligation to, to try to feed folks, and so we're just going to do our best. I, yeah, I'm trying to decide. You know, I'm trying to decide. I know we're out of time, and so we can yeah. wrap it up. Um, it's always the case. Actually, freak in. Uh, we, we didn't. We didn't. We didn't hit the top one of the topics I wanted, which was these, these corporate sponsored. Open source projects, and we just have to say that. That's all right. Now it's me not, not, not leaving Spaceport because I wanted to you know, let you open up a little bit about how the product product works and things like that. All right, Stephen. Um, so, so, Ash, I'll, I'll come in and thank you again uh, for joining us. For listeners, this was Ash's first podcast, and I think we did an excellent job. Uh, if you heard some clicks early on at the beginning, we had some sound issues to be fixed. And hopefully, if you didn't hear any, that means I did a great job in all of it erase this part of my recording. And Ash, if anyone is interested in following you on social media or where should they go? I think one of the easiest things is come to kashango.com and to the forum. They can also go to uh, Twitter, but I can't remember my handle to save my life. So, <laughs> Well, I'll make sure, I'll make sure that uh, we, we promote that out. I, I completely understand. And uh, Ash and Rob, thank you uh, both again for recording today. And uh, look forward to maybe in a couple months down the road, we'll, we'll re come back and see where we're at and uh, go from there. But thanks again. Thank you both. Okay.